Uh, I am probably or possibly under surveillance by the Drug Enforcement Administration, uh, private investigative officials, um, and various units of the NYPD. The FBI once told me that they weren't interested in me, which was kind of refreshing, who knows? See, see, when determining whether something is real or something is not real, it's real simple, get the facts. Keep up with me or it's over. Tonight on Frontline, the enigma of schizophrenia. The whole capacity of the individual to relate to the world has been shaken and devastated by this illness. And we don't understand why. The system's frustration with schizophrenia has often led to neglect of the most basic human needs. What we did is we emptied out the hospitals and then did not provide the care for these people. And we are now paying the consequences of really the severe mistakes we made back there. Tonight, Broken Minds. With funding provided by the financial support of viewers like you. And by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. This is Frontline. Oh, look, Patty, look there. Uh-huh. Is it we one, have one or two people? Look like one. I can't tell from here. It oh. might be two. Let's go closer. Okay. Somebody on this. I don't know. There's somebody there. Is that a person or just clothing? No, it's clothing. Here. Wow, here. look at that in there. What, what, what? For some reason, I'm, I have eagle's eyes. <laughs> way, way over. We're you talking. see it now. Okay. Or is that the folks? other guy? No, this is Jerry. That's the other guy who's, who's uh, okay, this very, guy. very, very paranoid. God, how are we going to approach him again? Yeah. This is what yes. we're going to do. I'm going to stop a little in the front, uh -huh. and then we get out and try to put the sandwich a few feet before he gets there to see if he pick it up. Okay, well, let's, we got to do it before he gets well, over here. We'll see. We get in there. Hold it. He looks bad. He's looking worse and worse. I know, he looks terrible. But it's so difficult to find him. Uh, he's going this direction? Yeah, he's going this direction. Okay. Well, I want him to see us through the front. Yeah, but we don't want to, we want to make it clear to him. Okay, he's on my side. All right, yes. You want to do it from the van? No. Yeah. Jerry, want a sandwich? Okay? Maybe he come back and take it. When a client that I approach in the park doesn't allow me to approach them for years. I understand. I don't take it personal. You tell me if I, if I encounter you in a park and I get out of the van and I go to you and offer you a sandwich, you tell me if you're going to take the sandwich from me. And you are normal, supposedly. You don't have any problems in your brain that doesn't make you perceive reality different than when a schizophrenic perceives it. Then you tell me how a schizophrenic who is paranoid is going to react when I offer a sandwich. They may think it's poison. They may think I'm coming to kill them. You never know what can, what can go through the mind of these people. Oh, oh Jerry's, Jerry's coming, coming back. back. Yeah, Jerry's coming back for the sandwich. All right, guy. God. Maybe he's going to sit. Yeah. There are at least 150,000 severely mentally ill men and women living in the parks and on the streets of this country. Project Reach Out is a private New York agency that tries to draw some of them in for shelter and treatment. Keep a distance, okay? Want a sandwich? 
See you later. Last year, Patty Moon and Margarita Lopez, one of three reach-out teams, made contact with more than 2,500. Okay. He took the sandwich. <laughs> Why? <laughs> You're some damn good instincts. God. How did you know to, to, to approach him again? I don't know. He was too, he was too, too settled there, too. So, look at, why look is it? He's going to eat it, even. Either that or he'll throw it. First sandwich. I know. I can't believe this. Margarita Lopez calls New York Central Park the largest open psychiatric ward in the world. 30% of the nation's homeless suffer severe mental illness and the most psychotic try to isolate themselves in places like this. The primary diagnosis is schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a major problem for us to understand, and it's been a tough nut to, to crack, and for a number of reasons. First of all, we can't sense a central problem in schizophrenia. We can only say, look, all of mental life is devastated by schizophrenia, and we can't point to a central mental function that is at the heart of the problem. That's not true of conditions like mental retardation or dementia or, uh, or manic depressive disorder. With each one of them, we can say, look, the central problem here is a dilapidation of intelligence, or uh, the central problem here is a dilapidation of mood. In schizophrenia, we say the whole mind and the whole capacity of the individual to relate to the world has been shaken and devastated by this illness. and We don't understand why. This was when the twins were a year old. Sharon is on the left and Marge is on the right. I look back and they were awfully cute then. And why so much attention was drawn to them when I would take them out in public. It's the kind of thing where I had all the dreams and everything that a typical parent has for their children. And then to see, see them cut down in, in uh, such a dramatic way, um, I guess, I guess I'm glad I didn't know then what I know today. What Amy Murphy didn't know then was that one of her daughters, Marge, would become acutely ill with schizophrenia in 1982, when she was a junior at college. In 1989, the Murphy twins and their mother came to the National Institutes of Mental Health in Washington to be part of a major study into the enigmatic causes of schizophrenia. Okay, this is for the procedure that Dr. Tori talked to me about. Marge, no, Marge, Marge. Marge. Okay, but, you, but you're not, you're not listening a minute. Will okay, you, you listen okay, I'll minute? listen. Okay. Remember we said you were going to have a needle in both arms and they're going to take the white blood cells out? Okay, that's, that's what I, you okay. told me. That's okay, the that's machine right. is that the is machine. doing it. Uh, yes. See, you didn't see the machine before. It's With Marge's illness, her whole personality has changed. It's like there's a shell that her body is standing there and it talks and says things, but the girl I knew... The daughter I raised isn't there. She, she's gone, or not quite gone, but almost. Marjorie, the, the only thing that's gonna be a little bit different about yours is that we have to do a finger stick first, which okay. we don't have to do with Sharon because we were able to get her blood yeah, sample the other Troy, day. Got in, got into her veins, right. but yours yeah. was and, and we couldn't, so we just have to do a when finger March stick When March got first. sick, Sharon lost lost her best friend. It's hard to describe how twins twins are, but they've always had each other and they've always shared each other. There's a bond that's that's so close that it's it's real hard to break. And when that bond is broken, it's hard to it's hard to replace. Now, I'm yeah, can you make a statement? What, what kind of a statement am I supposed to make? I don't know. Oh. 
In the case of the Murphy twins, Marge has a more severe form of the disease than the average person with schizophrenia. Uh, Marge is kind of in the same class as my sister, uh, who is hospitalized for many years also. Schizophrenia is a brain disease. We know that now. When my sister got sick in the 1950s, we didn't know that. And there was a lot of confusion about what schizophrenia was. We know now that schizophrenia is a disease like Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease or multiple sclerosis. We know that something gets in the brain and changes the chemistry in the brain and causes symptoms. So that the kind of symptoms that people have, and my sister had, are hearing voices, delusional thinking so that you misinterpret what's going on and think that things refer to you that don't refer to you, and the inability to think logically from A to B to C. Can you take this off, Anita Love? I don't, you know? No, no. Yeah, okay. We have to leave it in now for we'll a while. We'll have to leave it in <laughs> for a few minutes. Well, for being a bad little girl. No, you've been an excellent girl. Marjorie, you're yes. Marjorie, yes. Now, this, is, this is the 40 minutes now that we were telling you about. The when we take blood from the twins and we hook them up to the special machine that will take a small amount of blood, but will take selectively the lymphocytes that we want to study. They are the best means for studying the immune system. And we know that many people with schizophrenia have abnormalities in the immune system. And this one's shared. In all, there are 17 pairs of identical twins in the study. Identical in every way, except that one twin has schizophrenia. Yes, again. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to. I don't want to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay if you are. Okay, this is Sharon? Yeah. Yeah, that's Sharon. It's hard. Yeah. Really hard. You can actually yeah. see down the side of the yeah. Very hard to get. Yeah. Yeah. Identical twins are extremely useful for all kinds of medical research, including research on schizophrenia, because they start with the same genes. They start as basically clones of each other, if you like. And in any disease, including schizophrenia, where genetics are thought to play a role, this is the best way to separate the genetic from the non-genetic aspects of the disease. If it were a purely genetic disease, then whenever one set of an identical twins, whenever one person got the disease, the other one would always get it because they have the same genes. In studies of twins that have been done for about five decades now, the likelihood if one, that if one twin has the illness, the other twin will have the illness is only about 50 or 60 percent. In other words, half the time the twins are concordant, meaning they both have the illness, and half the time if one has the illness, the other one does not have the illness. Now this means by definition that genetics cannot be the entire story. We don't understand what the factors are that make it possible for someone to have the gene but not have the illness. But there are many human illnesses like this. This is not unique to schizophrenia. I'd like to ask you a couple of proverbs. Can you tell me what the saying means? A rolling stone gathers no moss. I don't know. What, what do you mean? <laughs> well, you know, this is a saying. This is something people sometimes say. A rolling stone... Is it a cliche? Sort of, yeah. Yeah. A rolling stone gathers no moss. What does, what does that mean to you? What is uh, moss, like grass on the ground? I think it's one of those things, that it's whatever yeah, you think it is. Yeah, and then a rock, you think you throw it? Well, I don't it's, know. It's a rolling stone gathers no moss. Okay, what, what that means to me? What does it mean to you? That, that something is moving so fast that it gathers no extraneous material. Okay. How about people who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones? Or stove thrones. <laughs> You've heard that one? Yes. Yeah. Okay, people in glass houses. The relief I got from the twin study was, you know, just incredible. Dr. Torrey said out of the first 35 things to worry about in life, getting sick like her ought to be 37 on my list. People looked at me and said, you've lost weight. And I hadn't lost any physical weight at all. I'm just kind of the same. But I knew what they were talking about because it was emotional weight that, that was gone. And, and people saw it. 
and and people I hadn't seen in years said that well since since the twin study she, she looks lighter and brighter and, and so much more relaxed. I I wish my life were different and and I wish this illness never existed, but it it's a part of my life and it is a part of who I am, and that's not going to change. Schizophrenia strikes one in 100. There are different degrees of severity. But to see the disease at its most severe is to see it untreated. We first met David when he had just come in from the cold to Project Reachout. Although he agreed to talk to our producer, DeWitt Sage, he was also deeply suspicious. David is a paranoid schizophrenic. The, uh, I, uh, the, uh... My stomach kind of gives me trouble when I don't have enough sleep. The stomach and the legs are the two things that uh, tend to most prominently go when I, uh, when I don't sleep. Reach out's Mike Master Giovanni is David's caseworker. Oops. Happens often. Yeah. What, what happened to the, to the lens there? They fell off my face one day in their glass, and it was they were cold, and it was cold, and so they were probably a little extra brittle and mango. Because this happened since the last time I saw you, right? Which was just uh, which was a couple days ago. Yeah, it it, it uh, fell and hit the sidewalk, and that's its glass lens. So. Have you confirmed your um, your prescription? Is it the right prescription? I uh, you were going to check that. I, out. I haven't. Uh, I I. I can't answer that at the moment, but the reason that I'm gonna that I'm confirm I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm setting up so that I can confirm the prescription is having had lenses stolen, uh -huh. so on tape, having had lenses had glasses disappear and then reappear when I squawked. Uh, so I definitely must 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 so that I can be safe crossing streets, make sure that I get the correct prescription, right. yeah. and uh, and that means all the way from all the way from the stage of getting the prescription to actually having the glasses made. And one other thing I'd really appreciate, in the light of what else is on the tape, this is going to make sense, I really appreciate if there's no transmitter embedded in the frame. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and, I, I, you know, I would hope that that's not the case. Like the one that's, what, pro see, like the, like the one that's probably here. Anyway, now that's what, back, folks. What, this will get lost on a cutting room floor for sure. Uh, I am probably or possibly under surveillance by the Drug Enforcement Administration, uh, private investigative officials, um, and various units of the NYPD. The FBI once told me that they weren't interested in me, which was kind of refreshing. Schizophrenia has to be viewed as the cancer of mental illnesses. It is certainly the most profound illness treated by psychiatrists. Part of the desperation uh, that people felt in treating this profoundly disabling and dramatic illness w was reflected in the, in the amazing treatments that were brought to bear on schizophrenia. I mean, there are treatments from 
surgical treatments where people would, you know, lobotomies, people would uh, do surgery on the brain, but there were surgical treatments on other organs. People used to take out the adrenal glands. Castration at one time was considered to be an effective treatment for schizophrenia. Uh, there have been all kinds of medical treatments. There have been all kinds of psychological treatments. Lobotomies to me, uh, just seeing them, devastated me. I was a part of it. You have to remember that uh, in the early 50s, there were no tranquilizers. Lobotomies were done for those patients that we completely had no control of. They were assaulting other patients, employees. We had over 15, 16,000 patients here. Uh, if you looked at a patient two weeks after admission, they have already started to regress. And if you picture yourself in one room, you know, nothing to think about, just meals. You were told it's meal time. You were told when it was time to go to the bathroom. Uh, that's how they existed. Well, lobotomies were the last resorts. I'm sure many of these patients had been patients that were in camisoles sheet restraints, uh, they may or may not have gone through insulin shock. There were the cold wraps. You can remove a camisole, you can remove a restraint. This is a mechanical device. Lobotomy was not mechanical. Lobotomies are permanent. Justin, can we talk for a minute? Sure. You want to sit up or do you want to lie down? Lie down. Really? Yeah. I remember on lobotomies, I'd bring the patient in, the doctor would be here. Complete head shaved. They would take gentian violet and score the, the head. Novocaine would be injected and the surgery would begin. The patient was fully awake. I remember as a young student, for that matter, I would be standing here and they would, on the side, the scapel, then they would use a little drill. And I remember, oh, uh, it, to me, especially as a young girl, I mean, this to me was absolutely terrible. Uh, they would take a probe and insert. They did not know where they were going, but they were hoping that something would slow down the process of this patient. Justin, what kind of treatments have you been given over the years? Uh, ambulatory insulin, insulin coma, electric shock, neurosurgery, and finally drug therapy. And finally? Drug therapy. And when you say neurosurgery, what do you mean? Brain surgery. I prefer the bottom of it. 152 at New York State Psychiatric Institute and Hospital, 722 West 168th Street, New York 22, New York, phone number Lorraine 8 to 1000. And as slowly as you can, and as clearly, what happened that day? The operation? We got a stretcher. Uh, I found myself being moved to a lighted room uh, with four surgeons there. But the Aronson? The Saturn, the Pierce, and at the Ransom. And they started the operation. That pairs out. In 1949, when Stanley Gross was lobotomized at Pilgrim State, the treatment was seen as a cure for the most extreme schizophrenia. Although the operation did subdue violence, it soon became clear that the underlying illness was not affected at all. Stanley, we had been warned, never discussed his operation. Father him No, he died uh, 
I told you about that time I had a bomb dropping and uh, boom, and it blew a big, a big great, uh, a great big hole about World War III in the ground. So we a baby bomb, a major bomb. Stanley, which planet should have come down to attack the Earth? The planet of Headbreakers. The, the planet of Headbreakers? Yeah, one million miles up, so you know it takes about two and a half days before uh, they can land. Travel a million miles an hour. Planet of Headbreakers, and Stanley's supposed to be the head of that planet. What? The Lord. How many heads has Stanley broken? What do you think? Do you remember? <laughs> Anything else you want to tell me? Oh, sorry. You see them break any heads around here? Did I see them break any heads around here? Did, did Stanley ever did, did break any heads in Pilgrim? In Pilgrim State, did Stanley ever break any heads? No. Okay, sir. But let me ask you a funny question. Did, Pil did Pilgrim State ever break any heads? I don't know. I know this isn't a joke. We're to have, we're to hold your head. And I'll tell you something. I went on a on a bulletin that was put up, that if a doctor did that, that anymore, he could find $15,000 and spend 10 years in jail. It's against the law to do it. What do you think, a doctor wants to go, go to prison for 10 years and pay By the time lobotomies were stopped at Pilgrim State in the mid-1950s, over 30,000 had been performed throughout the United States. At that time, this now abandoned building was filled beyond capacity, a monument to the ineffectiveness of any known treatment for schizophrenia. The desperate search for cause and treatment continued. It further polarized psychiatrists already divided between those who embraced the principles of modern medicine and the promise of antipsychotic drugs and those who held to the more dominant tradition of American psychiatry. Sigmund Freud's couch was never used as a window into the souls of madmen. While his theories revolutionized the way we think about ourselves, he never treated any schizophrenic patient. Freud considered psychoanalysis, his theory of unconscious drives and conflicts, inappropriate, impossible for the treatment of schizophrenia. But after Freud came to America to deliver a series of lectures in 1909, the practice of American psychiatry would eventually come to be dominated, as nowhere else, by the theories and techniques of psychoanalysis. Not infrequently, Freud's followers in treating schizophrenia would practice what the Founding Father never preached. An important thing to know about uh, uh, the Freudian idea is that it's fundamentally a, a salvationist idea. It says that it knows the cause and the trouble built into human nature and human life experience, and it has the cure for it. And we Americans at least have been again and again ready to take up, at least temporarily, with a new philosophy, a new doctrine, if we think it's going to make this world and this life in it better. That's what psychoanalysis offered to us. It's a shame that it didn't work out, really. I think psychoanalytic treatment for schizophrenia is not only not helpful, I think it's quite harmful. And the reason is because it implies very clearly that the reason the person is sick is because of the way they were treated in childhood, because of what happened with their mother, because of what happened with their father or their baby sister or whatever it is. We know that has nothing to do with it. I mean, would you talk about someone with polio? Would you ask them, gee, how did you feel when your little sister was born? If someone comes in with Alzheimer's disease or multiple sclerosis, you don't say, how did your mother treat you when you were little? It's that silly, and yet we still do that in some cases. Today, the struggle between opposing factions in psychiatry is largely resolved. There's wide agreement that schizophrenia is a disease and that psychoanalysis is an inappropriate treatment although no one disputes the important role of supportive talking therapy. But old ideas die hard. Some training institutes still teach that schizophrenia sometimes springs from the traumas of childhood. 
We asked Dr. Phyllis Meadow for an example. We absolutely know what causes schizophrenia, and I wish more people would just study schizophrenia in depth and learn about it. For example, the child comes into the world already frustrated. He's just been born, which is a terrible experience. And the only thing that woos him towards the life drives is the, uh, the relationship with the breast. He doesn't have a relationship with the mother, but he has a relationship with the breast. It's never there every time you want it but it's there enough of the time. I think some, some analysts refer to that as good enough mothering. That is, uh, the child can feel magical, omnipotent. He can call up the breast, and within a few minutes, he'll hear the noise of the breast approaching, something to indicate that the breast is forthcoming. He'll have a fantasy in his mind of a breast, and it will usually trickle milk if he's healthy. If he's very unhealthy, he'll roll over, feel apathetic, and feel there's no breast, there's no fantasy, and there's no way to get anything he needs. And that is what leads to pathology. Sometimes it leads to death. But that would certainly lead to schizophrenia. Hi, David. Morning, Dr. Nanger. I shake your hand, but... Uh... That's all right. Have a seat. We're in a different room this morning. This is David's second meeting with Dr. Jim Neininger, a reach-out volunteer psychiatrist who tries to treat schizophrenia with a combination of supportive talking therapy and medications. He believes both are necessary. So, um... yes. So I need to say it. I need to say it to first of this. Don't mind me. Call it my paranoia or my carefulness. Anyway, uh, that anything which has been taped prior to this on this date of what was yesterday's date, so I know today's Tuesday, October twenty fourth, was taped when, it, to my knowledge, the camera was not running. Therefore, I have not consented to its taping. Okay, that being said, the camera's now running and this stuff's all good. Okay, anyway, uh, don't mind me. I was, I was a political science major. Anyway, you know. So it's been a couple of weeks uh, since we met. Mm -hmm. uh, can you bring me up to date on how you've how you've been since then? I've been. Uh, my weekends have been fine. My weeknights have been hellish. And the weekends you have a place to stay, and, the, and during the week you don't, right? That's correct. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, during the week, I uh, lately have been inhabiting subway stations and parks. Does uh, that get you depressed to, to have to? Sure, it does. Sure, it does. And I, and I wonder, you know, I so, sort of think, wow, I'm depressed. Maybe I need an antidepressant, but who wouldn't be? Let me ask you this: How have you been sleeping? Uh, last night I slept great. If I had any decent place to stay, where as a rule a pair of glasses once went poof there, but but as where as a rule my uh, my possessions in my body aren't being searched, and I have something resembling a security perimeter between me and the other guy. I mean, I trust my friend implicitly, you, you know. Can sleep. Then I sleep Looks much like better. These glasses have almost gone poof. These aren't mine. <laughs> these aren't even my prescription, and the gla and they're glass glasses. So, and you'll notice that uh, I have yet to have a complete pair of glasses in months anyway and that the uh are there people here or recently that you've worked with that you do trust nobody implicitly i trust absolutely nobody implicitly that i have that i have met within the last two with, with since i came under surveillance at least nobody i can't uh you know it, it's like uh, unless i have I, I mean i take everything else on a situation by situation basis on uh you know if you, you when it comes to the level of trust but when it comes to uh nobody that i haven't that i've met since i since i undertook that surveillance could i tr ever trust implicitly there might be let me just tell you what my thoughts are at this point in terms of uh as you said i think you know you are at this point on an ongoing basis uh, uh getting treatment with your peer counseling and coming here and that's good so that if things started to emerge, uh, hopefully that could be contained, you know. Um, my own feeling, though, just so you know it, is that I think uh, probably low doses of medicine would help you in terms of minimizing the chance that under stress that you'd uh, feel too aggressive or that you'd hear voices. And also I think it might help you organize your, yeah. your thinking a little. You and I last time said, and I think we agree on that, that medicine would only make sense yeah. If it offered you something and that that outweighed any yeah, side Senator, effects. And yeah, that's why well, I'm not pushing it, but I want you to know well, it's let's available. Let's say one other thing. I, I, you mentioned something. I mentioned it too, sort of. But In the treatment of correct. schizophrenia today, okay. it is very uh, clear that the absolute right? mainstay of treatment the is the use of medications that reduce psychotic symptoms. But medications are not the whole story. And just like when a patient leaves a hospital with a heart attack, 
and they go out to an environment that's extremely stressful, they're not going to do well. The patient with schizophrenia goes to an environment that's extremely stressful, where there may be a great deal of difficult relationships and anxiety and hostility in their environment. They're not going to do well. Hello? Hello, sir? Would you like a sandwich? You would like a poncho? And a sandwich? Look, this is an invitation. If you would like to come to our Thanksgiving dinner, you will be welcome to come. Then It was clear in schizophrenia that if the brain were involved, it was a subtle problem because you didn't see it just by casually looking at the brain. So what we've needed to do is be able to say, well, what would this person's brain have looked like if they maybe never had schizophrenia? And in our view, the best solution to this is to look at twins, twins, where, the, where you have one twin that has the illness and one twin that does not have the illness. Now, if you look at the brains of these twins, and you find a consistent anatomical difference that goes along with that illness, you can pretty much conclude that this deviation is related to this illness. With twins, we've been able to say that these subtle anatomical deviations appear to be characteristic of almost every patient with the illness. Because when we compare them to what their brain should have looked like genetically, environmentally, etc., physically, if they didn't have the illness, it looks as though there's a consistent change that we see that is associated with the ill twin, but not associated with the well twin. Most of these areas involve what's called the limbic system, which is a part of the brain that we think is very important for emotion, memory, and higher order kinds of human behaviors. We think that Somehow, when this part of the brain was being formed, its connections, its wiring, the way cells early in development have to sort of travel. They travel from one part of the very primitive embryo brain to what becomes the fetal brain. There's good reason to think at this time that something goes wrong during that process that's affected the development of these areas. What the insult is, whether it's a virus or a toxin or a little less blood supply through the placenta, or some hormonal thing. We just have no information on that. Do you need help? No, 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 you can get down. Okay. Well, when I first heard schizophrenia as a diagnosis, my reaction was one of bewilderment and oh, shock. Yes, yeah. I, I need a hand. Oh. The most terrifying thing was when um, it was around four years ago. Uh, I had injured my foot, so I was on crutches. And in a blind psychotic rage, she came after me and tried to kill me. It was clear then that there was violence, intent. It, it takes all, all the courage I have to, to deal with this illness because the, the one thing is, is the most intimate relationship I, I've ever had in my life is, is gone. And, and then uh, on top of that, Marge has been hit harder than a lot of people I know. She's, she's far sicker than any of the other twins that, that, that I have talked to. Well, they told me I was sick as a dog and I had bubonic. Who told you that? Oh, one of the doctors. And when you went down to Washington, why did you go down there? Why did I go down there is because uh, there was a, a problem that uh, wasn't going to get straight. A problem with with whom or what? Well, I don't. Uh, there was a, a problem of uh, being on a on a ten most wanted list, and no one had turned me in in the United States.
when, when I think, who, who is that client there? A client that I know for, for three years. In three years, today was the first day that he accepted a sandwich from me and took it directly from my hands, you know. That's enormous progress. Some people may think that it's not progress, but it is a lot of progress. Because I bet that this man has been hospitalized a thousand times. I bet to you that he's been medicated a thousand times. And I bet to you that he's been discharged from the hospital to the street a thousand times. And I bet to you that he and here in Central Park every time that he gets discharged. 80% of the hospital beds for the mentally ill in the state system have been closed since 1955. Hundreds of thousands of people have been displaced from these hospitals. What we did is we emptied out the hospitals and then did not provide the care for these people. And we are now paying the consequences of really the severe mistakes we made back there. And to have literally at least 200,000 seriously mentally ill people on the streets in the United States with serious mental illnesses among the homeless population is probably a disgrace of a magnitude that we haven't seen in this century. Before its introduction of antipsychotic medications in the mid-60s, Bangor State Hospital in eastern Maine had 1,200 patients. Today, only 300, including Marge Murphy, are left. Now there is the suggestion that Marge, too, should prepare to leave the hospital. I was just wondering if you wanted to, if you had thought about after the hospital or what you wanted to do. I don't know. Uh -huh. you know okay. Uh, it depends. It's your concern about this is that the concern about it is it real you know okay. i you know i really can't go to an elementary school and walk in sit in a chair and just do it you know the the rea the reality of this i can't do it you know i can legally do some things and i can legally do others and then i cannot legally do anything yeah i don't know Right now, what's happening with Marge is they want her to move her from the hospital into what they call a less restrictive setting. The problem is Marge isn't really ready to go. It's, it's hard when she has been violent to know what to do. I think the most difficult thing for me to work through and deal with was having to call the police. To, to come and, and pick her up and take her back to the hospital. Um, to know that I had to do that um, for her benefit as well as for ours because she was out of control at that point in time and she was a danger both to herself and to possibly anybody else. And I didn't want anything to happen to any of us. If you had a choice of your living situation, what would you like? What would I, what, you know, you're asking me something and I don't know what you're talking about okay. again. Well, we're, okay. but we're talking about dreams of it. I'm not talking about a dream. I'm talking about a place to jump in a car, drive to and get out into it and sit and, you know, watch the football game. <laughs> oh, is yeah. that what you want to yeah. do is watch the football game? Yes. About leaving, you know, uh, I'm not a, a committed, a totally insane patient. I have a problem and it has to be, you know, fixed where it can be and then let out, you know, it's a material. What will fix it? I don't know. I don't know. Like, like they said, I might have to do a chemotherapy. Uh, with instruments, uh, electronic instruments, high voltage on it. Although Marge's thinking often seems bizarre, her severe psychosis has been successfully checked by medications and a safe hospital environment. Mrs. Murphy fears that if Marge leaves too soon, she will go off her medications 
become violent again and have to be forcibly returned to the hospital. The ward psychiatrist sees things differently. The most difficult problem that Marjorie faces at this time would be separation and individuation from her family. What I mean by that is she is an individual in her 20s who has never really been independent, has been able to live and function on her own. And I feel her greatest task is to pull away and to be able to develop a, a character and a personality for herself. I think it's very important for Marjorie to move away at this time and to be independent. She voices that desire quite regularly. She and I were talking earlier, and the hospital is a safe place for her. It's one of the few places that she knows she's not going to get kicked out of. She, she said, they've got to take me here. Other places, group homes, uh, boarding homes, apartments, and everything else, if mental patients get a little rowdy, they can be evicted from these, from these living situations. And then they have nowhere but the streets to go. Where's DeWitt? Where's DeWitt? Where's DeWitt? DeWitt, you keep up with me or it's over. I hope, maybe you've got all the videotape you need today. You keep up with me and continue to talk. This is not a photo op. Dave's habits. You got guys with long lenses and parabolic mics for that. Okay? I, no comment. <laughs> now, keep up with me. You want to talk with me? <laughs> Otherwise, I really mean it. It's over this morning. Not to mention for all. Where are we headed right now? Where are we and where are we, where are we going? I'm attempting to secure newspapers. My income doesn't permit me to buy them. I'm talking to us. By now, Thank David was convinced that Frontline was part of the government's surveillance network, which was sabotaging his life. But he had come to trust producer DeWitt Sage, and so he made one last exception. He would allow the crew to follow him on his morning rounds at Penn Station. Given the severity of his paranoia, it was an especially brave decision. Today's Wednesday, right? And how are things going with Reach Out, David? No comment. But tell me more about the, the quid pro quo, because I'm, this is important. And we well, The program is saying in a de facto manner that I have to... that I have to uh, be on medication to get housed. I repeat, there's no real justification for that. That's all I'll say about it right now. So you repeat what David I repeat, there's no, there, there's no, Hope is you're gonna I am not going to, I am not going to answer any more details than what I have just said. Remember, when I say no comment, no follow-up. When I say no comment, no follow-up. The discussion on that subject is ended. The, the idea of clowning, it's something that, that just evolved. What Marge's illness made me do is just, you know, stand up for myself more and say, the heck with this. I mean, I have all this pain to deal with. I'm going to do what I want to do. How do I cope? Well, I think under those circumstances, I'm doing remarkably well. In performing, the hardest thing I ever had to do 
was a birthday party for twins where where the little boy he was developmentally disabled in some way i i don't know what the diagnosis was but he he was disabled and the little girl was well and and i was almost in tears in the back and that's the only thing that has ever touched me that deeply that i really had to pull myself together that was the hardest thing i ever did i think for any family that's faced with schizophrenia the pain that is involved in it is is really extraordinary when you have identical twins especially identical twins that have been very close in which one gets sick it's almost like part of them has died because they're they're interchangeable in a way in terms of March, I think March is likely to benefit from some of the improvements in medication that are going to come along in the next decade. And I think she is going to really uh, benefit from the research that we're doing on the disease right now. She is someone that I can say is likely to see some uh, real uh, effects of the research we're doing on identical twins. In my thinking, one of the most fascinating things about the brain uh, evidence in schizophrenia is that it suggests that somebody's walking around for 20 years with something wrong with their brains, approximately 20 years, until the time that they manifest the illness. And that they're walking around with a brain abnormality, but for some reason they're able to compensate for it. For some reason, it doesn't show itself as a clear illness, disease, schizophrenia. It doesn't show that. In the case of the twins, we have two twins who are both relatively well, doing very well for most of their lives, even though one twin, it seems, was probably born with some difference in their brain from the other twin. Now, what happens that all of a sudden this brain difference, which can seemingly be compensated for for 20 years, all of a sudden is no longer compensatable? Is that environmental stress? We don't have an answer to that question. Strange things happen. Nah, what's up? What's up? I found it in the trash in uh, my buddy's building. Somebody threw it out. It's a fine make. The zipper is a little bit broken, uh, but uh, the snaps work, and you know, when you're sleeping in the subway or somewhere, it warms throughout a premium. It turned out that the morning filming at Penn Station was the last time we ever saw David. Having steadfastly refused medications for his paranoia, he parted company with Reach Out the next day. David is back where he was first found. What's your name? Jim. Jim? Okay. I like your beard. It's very nice. Then... This is the one that I'm talking about for Wednesday. Okay, you're very much welcome to come. Now, on Thursday, we also have another... I wonder why, why? Why we cannot deal with mental illness? What is so bad about it? What is so bad that people refuse to look at it, you know, and take care of the problem instead of ignore it, uh, put it in, in a psychiatric world where nobody can see it? or completely, you know, abandon them. But what keeps me going day by day is that after working with a client for three years and seeing that person coming into a van for the first time, it's so fulfilling that it's, it's bigger than it can be in the hands of a child. You know, it's bigger than, I don't know, than, than, you know that the miracle that is when, when the spring come, it's bigger than that. It's bigger than that. There are some moments of hope in the search for the cause and treatment of this terrible illness. But in the past, we have often, with the best of intentions, done more harm than good. There are now twice as many severely mentally ill people living on our streets as in all of our state mental hospitals. We are being tested 
to find solutions not just in our science, but in ourselves. Santa Claus. Where? Santa Claus. Over there. Where? Over across the across street. Across the street! I haven't seen him in so long. He's in so much shape. I can't believe he's still here. Okay, you have to put down now the, the, the videotape, please. Funding for Frontline is provided by the financial support of viewers like you and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Frontline is produced for the Documentary Consortium by WGBH Boston, which is solely responsible for its content. Video cassette information about this program, please write to this address. This is PBS.